welcome to the Wednesday Race Live session. First, we want to extend a welcome, a warm welcome to those who are joining us for the first time this week. We really as we would like to extend a welcome back to those of you who have joined us before. So since you're joining us, we want to just give you a little bit of context about the series. So this is a series between race, raise the awareness of coaching and education and the Bella and Bella Productions Foundation. I'm Gina Nelson, who I am the founder and creative, chief creative director of Bella and Bella Foundations. And our platform is really about supporting and nurturing strong communities of women. And why we've paired with race for this series, this is our third iteration, so thank you for joining us, is because we both believe that individuals can not only inspire, uplift, and empower themselves, as well as have a strong impact on others. Today, we have a spe two special guests, Sandra and Patishta, who are going to be part of our third series, which is titled Growth as a Pathway to Healing. So I want to say a warm welcome to those of you listening in the background, as well as to our two guest speakers. So Sandra, can we start with you? And can you please introduce yourself? Yes, we can, it's okay. Uh, so uh, my name is Sandra, as Gina said. Um, first of all, at this moment, I'm a mother. <laughs> I have a son, uh, I came from Portugal. Uh, at the moment I'm living in Dubai. And here my life changed a little bit. Um, I got sick when I arrived to Dubai. Uh, I had cancer and that just turned everything upside down and then back on the foot again, if I may say like this. So this journey brought me to um, writing a book about uh, what happened, about my personal growth. Uh, the book is called The Dance of Life, if you want to check later. Um, and what I do now is I work especially with ladies, individual or groups. If they have a problem, uh, usually it's a, a, a deep pain that comes from, from life, from cancer or from a divorce or from a relationship. And then we try to work on it and overcome. And that's why it came this, the growth as a pathway for, for him. Why do I work like this? And what is my background? Why do I speak about this? Um, I'm a teacher from profession. Um, I'm a psychologist. I'm a practitioner from traditional Chinese medicine. And along the years, as I was um, getting in contact with persons, um, behind every healing, behind everything, I found always a pain. And it was the pain that uh, developed everything. So my background is always working with people uh, and try to uncover the pain that it's behind of uh, what's happening in the present moment in life for everyone. Uh, I work from Dubai now, but um, that's that's me now. Um, I'll pass my, my time now for Pratishta if she wants to speak a bit about herself. Hey, thanks, uh, Sandra, and thanks, Gina, for, for calling me here. So about me, I'm currently working as a leadership wellness coach. Uh, specifically, I help leaders who are suffering from chronic anxiety and panic attacks to lead an anxiety-free life. Uh, where I'm coming from, <laughs> well, I was, uh, I'm an engineer and an MBA by qualification, and I was working as a data science consultant in an MNC for a long period of my life. And throughout those periods of my uh, corporate life, I realized that things were not as I wanted to be. On the surface level, everyone was like, you are having the perfect job. Uh, you are having the highest, it's called the most sexy job of today. Uh, if you are in data science, working in artificial intelligence, and that too in an MNC. Uh, and I had a perfect family for people. I had my husband and my in-laws. They are very supportive. but. It was all, all on the outside. Uh, inside, there was such, like a different me. Someone who was struggling day and night, working 16 to 17 hours, suffering from anxiety. And 
there was a point in time uh, where I just had to stop. And I'll, I'll, as we'll go out uh, about in our session, I'll share what happened. But that was a time where I started understanding what is happening to me. Why is it happening to me? That was a question. And uh, this journey started in 2018 where I quit my job and I started on this process of healing and towards growth. Because before that, whatever I was doing, I was just following the herd. Okay, because in India, every second person wants to do engineering and then MBA and then we get a job, high paying job. Because if you are from a middle class family, uh, the, the first thing you think of is get a job. So that was the path. I was following the regular path. And it took me a lot of pain to just uh, just understand this is not my path, this is not for me. And then get on my journey. I, I am an, now a certified NLP trainer. Uh, I'm a mindfulness coach. Uh, along with that, I'm doing my uh, ICF trainings and learning. I'm on the path to my PCC. So now my journey is completely different to what my earlier education background was. And the best part is that uh, whatever I'm doing, it makes me happy. So thank you so much, that is about me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you ladies for the wonderful introductions. We're gonna delve deeper into your stories as well as how you've made different transformations in your life. So I wanna just share with our audience who are joining us today and just joining, um, what the objectives of our session, a round table discussion is, even though we're in different locations. So first we're gonna take some time to unpack the definition and the meaning of healing. And both Sandra and Patishta will both share one of their experiences. Then we're gonna explore the connections between the mind and body and how that could influence your healing. And then we'll discuss our own journeys, um, how in our own journeys to heal ourselves, we could also create space for others to then heal themselves. And then last, Patishta and Sandra are gonna share four ways in which evidence based ways in which you can be on your journey to healing. So I'm going to begin and just start with Sandra. Can you just start and tell us what is your definition of healing? And maybe if you could articulate also what it isn't so that our audience members listening today have a clear idea of what healing entails. For me, um, I'm very practical. Um, and there's, for me, there's a, a general definition for healing that I used to say it's like the process of becoming healthy. If we go to the basics, healing, for me, it's the process of becoming healthy. Then it gets complicated <laughs> or complex. <laughs> Why? Um, because we can see, we can say that we are healthy in the body. We are healthy in the mind, in the way we think. We are emotionally healthy, or we can go beyond and we can say, I'm spiritual healthy, and or all of it. So that's where I start um, with the definition of health. Um, because if in a moment I have a physical pain, so I will address that pain so I can become healthy. But if I'm in a, for instance, if I'm in a relationship and I'm emotionally not healthy because that is damaging my emotions, so I need to address that emotion or that group of emotions so I can get healthy again. So it's another type of being healthy. And then when nothing works and we say, I tried everything and I'm not okay. Then we go to the energetic part, the spiritual part, where we can do another type of healing. So healing, it's complex. If someone wants to sometimes ask, so where do I start? Start with a pain, with a physical pain, where it hurts because that's the bottom of the, um, of the process or the beginning of the process. Imagine that you have a pain in your arm, I'm just hypothetically speaking, and the pain doesn't go away for nothing. We tried everything. So we will dig into that pain to initiate the process of healing. And when that physical pain is being cured, 
everything that is around the pain, it will pop and we can address it. And then we can go in our path to healing. What happens is um, sometimes in the process of healing, we adopt one, um, how can I say, one personal position and we mix pain with suffering. If we want to get healed, we need to forget the suffering. We need to accept the pain. Because that's now when I go to the other part, what is not healing? Not healing for me, it's when we stay in the, in the how can I say, in the position of I'm always suffering. Oh, poor dear. Oh, my God. Everything happens to me. I don't know what I will do. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not healing. We will not move when we are in this position. Healing is when we get responsible for what's happening to us. And I say, this is where I am. I take the responsibility, even if I don't know where to go, but I'm responsible for where I am right now. Even if I have the pain in my arm, if I have the anguish in my heart, I have much more. But from the moment that I assume the responsibility of, okay, I will start this, I will be healed, I will be cured. And then we initiate the process of healing and that will be healing. Doesn't matter if it goes only to the body, to the mind, to the emotions or to the energy as, we, as I spoke. But we need to take the responsibility to put the victim, if I may say like this, the suffering on the side, facing the fear of the pain that will come and start the journey. Then we get healed. Then we get healthy. That's the way I see to start. Thank you, Sandra. And Patricia, Welcome. I don't know if you want to add on to some of the things that Patricia, uh, Sandra mentioned regarding healing or you want to just comment on what your understanding is from your own shared experience? Yeah, uh, I totally, uh, like I was able to resonate with Sandra when she, she was saying that uh, pain is something, is, it should not be associated with suffering. And I remembered this Dalai Lama quote, which says, uh, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. I read it in Sadhguru's book also. So they uh, directly just, uh, I just, I was able to just co collaborate that. Uh, and it's true. Uh, if uh, if we have a pain, it, it is go uh, because as we grow up, we have to go through some pain in our life so that we can uh, learn, we can grow. If there is no pain, there, then there is no growth as well, right? So pain is important for us to just become more humble. If no, if a person who has never suffered any pain, they are, I, I, I've actually seen some people, uh, their, their attitude is totally different because they never, don't, don't know the meaning of pain. But the person who has uh, suffered, like seen that pain and then grown out of it, that person has actually become more humble. And uh, something that I want to add on is healing starts when we start operating from a point of love. Okay, because uh, when we are we are feeling uh, we are not healed means we are having a pain somewhere we are away from love we are not feeling love if you see the most basic emotion that we need is love either it's love from others or from ourselves and if you really want to heal uh, as you as you go on the journey you start experiencing more love and you start operating from that point. Yeah, no, that's uh, so about point. Thanks, and I want to add, yeah, and I want to add one point with which I was uh, thinking before our session today, and I thought I will add here that some people ask why do I need to heal? So, for example, if I'm having anxiety, why can't I just take a pill and just enjoy my life? It is it is working for me, but I think uh, if you are not healing, you are passing it on to your next generation. You are giving it as a gift to your younger generation. Your pain is somewhere going to show up on them. Uh, you will see that your if you are anxious, you will find those patterns in your children because they have mirrored you. Like there is a concept of mirror you, mirror neurons. 
and it directly sees that the child learns from what the parent is doing so if you are always showing them anxious behavior if you are an ocd for example and you are not healing yourself ocd is obsessive compulsive disorder if you are not doing it you will see the child is also building upon those patterns so it's very important that somewhere it stops it stops at you you heal yourself so that you don't pass it to the next generation yeah so that's a valid point patricia because i have heard that in terms of you what you're experiencing if you kind of unpack your family's history of maybe mm -hmm. trauma and um, other issues that are related to not being well and not healing that that can help you on your journey. So maybe having the conversations with your parents and grandparents if they're still living. Um, but you both touched on a very important points when it comes to healing. So that awareness. So Sandra, you specifically talked about the physical, like being in touch with what's happening in your body. Both of you have mentioned that. So which brings me to the next question. What do you think about the mind-body connections and how can that enhance healing? Patricia, do you, would you like to start there? Yeah, sure. So uh, actually, uh, when it's anxiety or some, some mental issues, we tend to put it under the rug. We think it's not important. Let me just focus on my work, right? We are always, always trying to focus on get more successful, hustle hard. And we are just trying to divert our attention to something which is more materialistic, get more money. Uh, and we think that these thoughts are just I can just get so just swipe them under the rug. But over a period of time, when you don't look at them, what your mind is saying, it starts coming on your body. Something which I personally experienced. Uh, because I remember as I, uh, I was 17 and I just left my home to study in a hostel, like in a college which was away from my home. So I had to stay in the hostel. And it was the first time I was living in a hostel and the life was totally different. And from there, I started experiencing anxiety, but I would always put it under the rug, thinking that, oh, brother, so just focus, you need to grow, you need to be successful, let people make the comments they are making. Once you will be successful, you, you everything will just settle down. <laughs> like, that is what my process was. So I was just studying and growing. And uh, there came a point when it started impacting me, uh, my physical body very, very much. Like, I uh, in the beginning, as I told you, there was a point where I ha I had this, started having frozen arm, so my arm would not move. My le specifically my la left arm, it would like just get swollen this much, and the doctor said that this is a small nerve issue. But then there was one night where it was paining so badly, it was just not moving, and I had to go to hospital. And that time, the doctor told me that maybe it is stress, but let me do an ECG. And you know that time I felt the moment he's going to do an ECG, he's going to do angiography. He'll put a stunt in my head, uh, in my heart, and I have to live with those medications for the rest of my life because my anxious brain was telling me what the end is going to be. And that time I just got panicked and I shouted at him that let me go to my house. I just don't want to stay here. And that entire night I was crying, thinking what is happening to me. That that pain, physical pain started, uh, like, helped me introspect what am I doing wrong in my life? Mm -hmm. What I need to improve? Uh, why, why is it going wrong? I'm trying to be good to everyone, not saying no. I'm trying to do, even if I don't like the work I'm doing, I'm trying to do it because it's uh, something I, I must do. Mm -hmm. And they, from there, from that awareness, from that pain, this journey started. And I started learning from mentors and coaches. That time I seeked help. If the physical pain would not have come at that time, maybe it would have taken me more years to start my healing journey. And it would have been a bigger problem, maybe real heart attack. I, I, I don't say it does, it does happen with people as I'm talking to a lot of people these days. I hear them telling the, the problems they are facing because of their anxiety. Two days back, I had a person who was telling about IBS. He was having mm -hmm. uh, irritated uh, bowel syndrome. I could go to the study that it is directly coming from stress. Okay, so some some your test needs to be uh, taken care of if you want to get rid of IBS. Simply, sim uh, similarly, there are many diseases. If you don't take care of your anxiety and your stress, they, they, they come as big diseases. So some of you, you just the moment you have a small disease, just connect with your body uh, and understand and start your healing journey. The sooner sooner you do it, I think the easier it will be. 
<laughs> Thank you, for, Patricia, for sharing that. And it's true, like we, we know our bodies best. And sometimes just being in tune with our bodies and there's great connections between that and healing. And Sandra, thank you, Patricia. Uh, Sandra, um, how would you say those mind-body connections exhibited for you along your healing journey? I can see in a, like, oops, in two ways. I imagine that here we have the body and here we have the energy. So from the body until the energy, we can see our mental and our emotional in the middle. Okay. Um, and I'm going to base this on the Chinese med in the, on the, on the Chinese um, medicine principles. It's easy to understand. Um, we have the body down and we have a pain. Chinese medicine says that we should address the disease before it's manifested in the body. So we should address the disease when she's in the energy level. But how, how do we know this? How do we know a disease is there if we don't have any physical manifest manifestation? So we have to dig deep. We have, um, we say, um, how can I, uh, I'm just missing the word like science. Imagine that we don't have a physical pathology uh, installed. Or I'll give you my example. I had cancer. The cancer was in my body for a long time. I didn't know. But the, the signs were there before. If I would see the signs before, like um, mood swings, like um, uh, some very tiny changes in my in in myself, I would be able to address it before. What happens is sometimes we are not aware of the small things that say mm, something is there that you need to pay attention. So what happens is we just address when we come to the level of the body. And then we go up. If we are lucky to address when it's in the level up of the energy, we would save a lot of the diseases in the body. So this is a connection. If we see something in the body, we know that the mental is affected. We know the emotions are affected. And we know the energy is affected. If it doesn't reach the body, it's on the emotions or the mental, uh, the emotional, sorry, and energetic. But when it comes to the body, that's why we need to go back. And that's why Pratisha was saying she had the pain. Mm -hmm. The pain was the last call. It is for all of us. Physical pain, it's the last call for something that it's not working with us. And you can have a very easy way to see it. Imagine that you go uh, for an exam and you are, you know everything. You are a perfect student for that matter. You know everything, you are super ready, but just before the exam, you start like, <laughs> and you have to rush to the buffer because you just flushed it, everything, all your emotions, all your mental, all your fears, everything, just go to your gut and you have to release it yeah. in a matter of speak. So this, this, this is what it should happen in the process of uh, spiritual or mental body. We should, when it happens, we acknowledge until the bottom of the body and we release. Mm -hmm. When we don't release, we get pain. That's how I see the connection both ways. Yeah, valid points uh, that both of you made in terms of being aware again, the awareness that something's taking place in your body that's not right. And Patricia, I know you specifically said it was, you know, maybe expectations, maybe it's cultural expectations about what you're supposed to do in terms of your job, in terms of performing, but really being attuned to ourselves and our bodies. I, I wanna ask both of you something. 
where would you say, because we know that emotions in the mind is very connected, what kind of techniques you've used personally in terms of managing, I don't want to say managing your emotions, but being able to channel your emotions in a way that will help you on your pathway to healing. So if you could share a, a technique that you currently use with our listeners today. So Patricia, can I start with you? Um, yeah, I have, I use a lot of the, the techniques that I have learned from my mentors. Uh, a lot of visualization that helps me um, and a lot of journaling. So um, I don't write on the notepad, though I say everyone to write it. <laughs> to confess, I cannot write on the notepad. My handwriting is really bad. If anybody would go back and read, they cannot. So I put it on my laptop or my phone. Whenever I'm feeling something, I put it out. Uh, so a lot of journaling helps to me to clear my mind and a lot of visualization where uh, if I'm not feeling uh, confident, how I, I visualize myself in the in my confident avatar. So I, I do a lot of that visualization, uh, self hypnosis, uh, hypnosis, uh, self uh, hypnosis. Uh, so a lot of meditation and visualization that had, that has helped me actually make a move. And then there are some other techniques uh, which uh, I do at, at the advanced level that helped me from my uh, coaches and mentors that I have learned. If I have to share just one, it would be simplest, would be write your uh, write whatever you have on a piece of paper. Uh, it releases a lot of things and clarifies a lot of things in your mind. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia. And Sandra, I'm going to have you add to that. But Patricia, I, I agree with both of your methods. Um, there's such great power in journaling in terms of, you know, channeling that energy. Um, sometimes people do a brain dump. They may do it in the morning. They may do it when they're anxious, etc. But it's extremely helpful. I do it myself. Sanja, please. Thank you. I'm going for something out of the box and fun. <laughs> because we all know journaling is really important. I do it. But, you know, in those moments that I'm just, it happens to me and what I'm doing, everything I, I say, I did it or I do. Okay. So imagine that I just wake up with the wrong mindset. I'm feeling crappy and, uh, and everything is done and I have a full day ahead. Right. And I just have to shift something. I, uh, what I do is I go to a music platform and I choose a music that I, that makes me feel really happy. Just that gives me energy and, uh, where I can really dance. I'll just put the, it's really, I put the music. It, it needs to be bigger than like two or three minutes and in dance. I put the music loud and really I dance whatever it comes to my mind. And I guarantee you, if after that three or four minutes <laughs> you still down, you are still down, then you just find a boxing thing, a pillow <laughs> or whatever, really, and just give some punches. <laughs> it works. It's not the long term, but it makes us shift the morning from a bad day to a good or to a better day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, for me, it really works because it makes me feel good. Yeah. I don't know if. There are um, a lot of other scenes, a uh, lot of other things that I can share. And if someone needs more tools, I have a lot of tools. I know Pratisha has a lot of tools, but this one acts in the moment. Yeah. You have to deal with the moment. You have a full day ahead and you cannot afford in that day to stay at home. So you have to shift. And the, 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 bad, the bad emotions that come to our mind Sometimes they are hard, they are strong, and we cannot shift by ourselves. And sometimes journaling in this moment, it doesn't help. So this is my kind of SOS. 
<laughs> we, we love it, Sandra. We'll be all dancing with you. We actually love it. <laughs> but I, I love what both of you um, talked about. I mean, because I think both of your techniques help to reframe the situation and help you with going through whatever emotions you're going through. Different techniques, but both equally powerful. So thank you for sharing that. We'll now go to how the last part, when, because remember we said that race and Bella and Bella um, Foundation is really about empowering individuals. So how can you say your own personal journey of healing has helped create spaces where individuals can actually take the time and do a lot of unpacking and discovering to actually heal themselves. So Patricia, can I start with you, please? Um, my personal healing, uh, the way it had supported me is like, I was able to make big decisions of my life. If, uh, if I was not, if I had not taken that journey of healing myself, I would have been the same person. I was not confident enough to speak that much. I remember when, in, on this journey, I had practiced keeping my anxiety on the side and speaking to you. Uh, like, if I have to really speak uh, in front of a big audience, there was a point in my life I was not able to do that. But this healing helped me. And some of you, because I am healing myself, I'm working on myself, when I'm sharing with people, it comes from a point of authenticity and something which is more practical, something which I'm able to apply on myself, that is what I'm sharing. Um, also, uh, it, it helps you with, uh, that you are able to operate from the point of love and not expectations. So if, if you are healed, if you are on that journey, when you are giving, you give with all your heart, not expecting a lot from people. Uh, if, if someone has not healed themselves and they just study some books and they come, uh, sharing that knowledge somewhere I feel that is good knowledge so if, if you really want to help a human being it's not a code right if you learn a code you just put the code and it's running it's not that it's a human being so if you are if you're helping a human being you need to be human and you need to uh, you need to feel yourself somewhere you need to know how these things are working which which I think has is helping me uh, helping my clients get those big big uh so that is what i wanted to share uh gina uh can i uh, share something which when sandra was uh, sharing it was coming in my mind and like now i don't stop myself, uh, from holding over i should not speak. i just wanted to share something when she was sharing an sos i was thinking wow yeah why didn't i thought of sharing an sos and i think uh, i would like to share that do i have your permission yes of course yes <laughs> Her motivation is amazing. Uh, something which works for me is uh, more on controlling my breathing because I find that when I have those negative thoughts, I I am breathing. I'm, my breathing is very shallow, so I just uh, take few minutes, not much, just two to three minutes, to just straighten up my body and just breathe uh, deeply. Uh, that itself starts getting me in the positive side. And then I ask myself uh, a question, what do I want my perfect day to look like today? And uh, that gives me a breakthrough. Uh, so I just wanted to share when she was sharing, I said, yeah, I should also yeah. share. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. You, you just reminded me that actually is something very important, the breathing and um, paying attention, slowing down your breathing, because that definitely helps and changes your state, uh, whatever it is. And it also reminded me of something um, that Matthew Kelly, who's a, a Australian author, when he talks about, he thinks about what his perfect day is gonna look like. So I'd like that you shared that. Thank you, Patricia. Sandra. Thank you. <laughs> um, can you just repeat, so I just make the connection, uh, the question. <laughs> The person, okay. our personal journey uh, and opening the space for healing, right? Exactly. About your yeah. personal journey and how has it opened the space for others? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, when this time, I, I didn't know I was using or these tools or what I would learn would be used as a, as a tool to work with others or whatever. Um, so I have three things that... It defined me in the beginning, and probably now you will see how I evolved from there, and you see what happened. When I was a teenager, 
I was like the um, invisible girl, always quiet, an introvert, very shy, and always on my place. I would be scared to death to speak. I just couldn't speak to more than one person at a time. I would be shivering and sweating and just be in the corner, back, 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 back in the room. So this was me. One day I realized this was not being healthy for me because I was always anxious. So I decided to see why is this happening? Why do I get anxious if I have to speak? We all have one mouth, so we all can speak. So why do I get anxious about it? So that's where I started to let me put myself out there. If someone addresses me, I will speak with that person and with one more. Even if it's just saying hello. And I, when I decided to do this, I said, oh my God, now this is coming to me and I have to say hello to another person. Ah. But I decided to face this. So this was one thing. So I became, I, I changed from an introvert, from a shy person, to kind of a normal person that can have a social conversation, but never a speaker in my mind. But I said, let's go, let's move on. Until the day I turned 18 and I got my driver's license. And I was, yeah, 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 very good. <laughs> And my mom and my dad, they were really amazing. And they offered me a very old car, but it was a car. And I said, yes, now I can drive. Yeah. That was not good. Because I realized I was scared to drive to a place that I didn't know where it was, what it was, or what I was going to find. So I would not drive anywhere. I was really scared of everything that came as the unknown. And life started to give me lessons. <laughs> I was living in a small town. I got a job in the big town. I was getting out late. I could not go in public transportation, so I had to take my car. Lesson. So I had to grow. In that place, I had to speak with a lot of people because they were speaking with anxiety and da, 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 da. So I had to speak with them to explain. So I was speaking, I was driving, <laughs> and okay, it was my country, so the unknown became unknown. And then I had to go out of my country. And I had to learn different languages. And I had to drive in Morocco where no one respects the rules that I was used to. So I had to face my fears again. And I had to grow. I had to speak with people from around the world with different cultural backgrounds from different countries. Mm -hmm. And it was not the end. Then I came to Dubai, one of the biggest cities in the world. And when I arrived here, I had to drive. And so... And then I got sick. And then people started to ask me to speak about what happened to me. So I said, so everything is interconnected. I was finding space. At the same time, I was healing myself. You see? So I don't know what is everyone, any, uh, the other person's journey, but what happens is, when we acknowledge something in us that we want to heal, and it, like Pratista said, it comes from the heart because I honestly decided that I wanted to lose those fears. So life started giving me lessons day after day, year after year. And I was 18, now I'm 46. And if you ask me, are you comfortable to drive in Dubai? I have to, but it's not comfortable. I found enough space 
but I'm not at the top. I know I have some more to dig in. And this is, I think this is how we find the space. We learn, we teach, we interconnect, we support another person, and then life gives us another thing. Then we will have to find space again. And that's how we grow. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that story, Sandra. Yeah, seems like you've made, adapted, um, try to navigate different things as you went along your journey. Sandra, I just have one question before we go to our last bit where we're wrapping up and talking about four evidence-based pathways. Where would you say self-talk played in that journey when you were back in Portugal going where, from a small where, town? Where? Um, self-talk. How do you think self-talk played a part in your healing journey? Like self, like self-talk? Yes, self-talk, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I make uh, full movies inside my head. Okay. I'm a very verbal person. And in the beginning, my self-talk was coming from a place of fear. And I tried, I don't say that today it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it does. Because we. I'm in a different place than I was 20 years or 25 years ago. But what I do with my self-talk is if I see that uh, my words inside my head take me to the, the a position of fear. Ooh, okay, just forget it. The hands take me to a position of fear. I try to change. And that's where I use the music and the dance to shift my mind to a more positive or from a position of happiness. Uh, happiness for me is connected with love. If I feel happy, I can go to a position of love and move forward. So my self-talk, it's always say, stop thinking. Or if you have to think about it, do it and let go and move on. Like imagine there's wind coming into a, a ear. Okay, now everything is here. And then, okay, flush it to the other side. And then I try to put myself with a different self-talk. Okay. Thank, no, no. Thank you, Sandra. That's important. I mean, we, we all have self-talk. How much is, and, and I know, Patricia, you're going to talk about this a little bit in terms of that ruminating thoughts that we may be going through our minds at a time, at uh, any given time. So thank you for sharing, uh, Sandra. So we'll start and actually wrap up our session with the four evidence-based pathways. And maybe we could start with that, um, Patricia. Um, how could you say you have been moved from that whole idea of breaking the loop of ruminating thoughts into what would seem as if it's helplessness to then having some control and self-efficacy around um, your healing journey? Uh, Gina, the one thing that really, really helped me was uh, the con concept I learned about outcome-oriented approach rather than just going from one task to another. Um, because I was always task-oriented, let me get this job and then I will prove to everyone. Like, I don't know why I wanted to prove to everyone. <laughs> it happens like sometimes when you are coming from that background, sometimes you just want to prove that I'm good enough. Because uh, people you are meeting, uh, they are always telling you why you are not eligible for this and you are trying to just just prove yourself uh, so I was always trying to do this one degree after another and trying to prove myself now I will be good enough but it was all task oriented and I was not happy with it but the moment I started uh, taking the other approach which is purpose oriented outcome oriented why I am doing what I am doing that one shift actually helped me make all those shifts because the moment I had a clear purpose, I know what I why I want to do what I'm doing right now, why I'm doing it for myself, for my family, for the society. How will I contribute? How will it leave a legacy? My entire approach has changed, and I am able to move from that place of always thinking I'm not good enough, uh, I will never be right. 
<laughs> if I speak, I, I they will they, they'll think I'm stupid. So from that point to making that shift of okay, I have this purpose. Let me learn this. Uh, let me uh, if I have to uh, if I have to become a coach. Let me go to, uh, to the best coaching institute. Learn from them what they already know. What I do. So it helped me get that direction. So one thing I want to share with the audience is like have a purpose and then think what all things you need to do to approach that purpose to reach your uh, ultimate goal. Because uh, most of us plan our vacation, we are planning our day-to-day -day life, we are planning what phone we need to buy, but we never plan our own life, right? We are not planning our own life. So just sit down and make a plan for your own life. Have a purpose-oriented approach, so that you are not you are not feeling lost after every uh, problem. Because still today, when I am in this journey, I know I still face setbacks. In fact, I want to share. Yesterday, I was talking to someone, and from the very first conversation, she was trying to find out what is wrong with me. Uh, so ultimately, she was able to find out that uh, I cannot do what uh, uh, among two or three things. I was able to do one, not the other. So she said that I cannot have you. I said thank you very much, but it did not. It no longer hurted me. If it had, would have happened like five or ten years ago, like I would have been devastated. Why she doing to me? Is it because of the color of my skin? By the because of the way I was speaking? What is happening? But yesterday I felt okay. Thank you. Maybe not right now. No means not now. Maybe that that that's how I started taking a no. Uh, it it doesn't hurt me that much. I don't have to prove her. No, listen. I am good enough. You have to take me. It's no longer coming from that space. It's like okay, if if we are meant meant to be on on the same journey, we'll surely get along. Otherwise. That, that sense of detachment has come because I know I have a bigger purpose and I'm working towards a bigger purpose. So one thing is that. Uh, do you want Sandra to share one tip and then I share the next or? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yes, you can continue, um, Patricia. You might as well continue and then we'll move to Sandra. So thank you for sharing that around. Um, in terms of finding our why, um, being connected to our purpose, and that's helping you on your journey. Sure. Would you like to share the next tip? Yeah, the next is like uh, from monkey mind to a monk mind, and that is a journey. It doesn't happen in a day. Just because we have some tips and like we leave something, and so many of many people I meet, they just want quick fixes and band aids. They think that okay, my uh, my mind is a, like a monkey mind. I cannot uh, I cannot uh, focus. I'm having anxiety issue. I'm having I have clients who are saying okay i have ocd can you fix me in one hour i said i am not here to fix you and it is a journey that you have to take i always say from a monk uh, monk monkey mind to a monk mind it, it is a journey and every single every single step that you are taking every small uh, action that you take even if it is like dancing or just breathing right or just thinking about your next step in a positive direction, whatever small uh, thing you are doing, you are creating new neural connections. You are mm -hmm. giving your mind a new way of thinking, and it would build up. Like uh, it didn't happen to me the first day I learned NLP or any other technique. It happened every single day, and because I'm practicing it from four, like last four years, I can see the shift. What I was, what versus what I am. Mm -hmm. So it it because the now my mind. I'm talking for me. Now my mind has a new way of thinking. The problem is still the same. Yesterday, like I told you, I got rejected just yesterday. And I was like grateful and happy. And today I'm I'm sitting with you and happy. Uh, operating from the point of love that thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. It, 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 there is no hatred or anger or anything with that no. Because I'm no longer attached to that no. But it didn't came in the first day. It didn't came in the first month. It is taking me every single day, and sometimes it is an effort because I am just telling my mind what is the new way of thinking, and I am on a journey. I am still not perfect. I am trying to learn. I have mentors. I, I every day I am trying to learn from them. So that is what. Take it as a journey. It won't happen in a day. Nobody will quick fix you. No, even if they give you a band aid, uh, it doesn't work in the long run. So. Consider it as a long-term thing that you need to do, specifically because you took like ten years, twenty years, forty years to spoil your neural connections. 
how can you expect uh, them to become right in your mind to become right in one day or one month it will take some time <laughs> Yeah. No, no, no. I, I'd like that point, uh, Patricia, so that you mentioned about we're all on a journey. So it will take a process. It is a process, actually, uh, this whole process of transformation and looking inward. Uh, Sandra, um, if we could talk about how you move from external control to internal control. So if we could share that, please. Yeah, uh, that's for me, um, it's a process itself. We believe uh, that we control everything around us. Yeah. And we do everything in our reach to have everything pretty neat and everything controlled so the day can go smoothly. And then we just put ourselves in our car and we have a, a hole in the tire and the whole day just turns upside down and we just say a bunch of bad words and we get our day just damaged because we allowed ourselves to let the external control our emotions, control our day, control our mood. It's not easy to shift. It takes time. It's the same as shifting from being a perfectionist. I was a perfectionist <laughs> to allow myself to fail, allow myself to choose different if the situation requires, even if before I said something different. What I want to, to acknowledge with this is when I let my life be led by external control and by what others say, and that will influence my whole day, and my mood gets influenced by what is happening outside, I will never start any journey. I, I, I can't. No one can. Because we cannot control what's in the outside. Or the only thing we can control is how we feel about it, how we can act and not react. So what I what I try to do, and I say try because this is a challenge, uh, is every time I see that I'm being influenced by external things, I'll just stop what I'm doing. I literally stop what I'm doing. And I try to understand why are you reacting like this and not having a proactive action? Uh, one time I was so into this, I didn't realize I was driving, I was anxious, I was furious about what happened, I was going to do something with for a group of people, and I said, I cannot get there like this. I just can't. It's just the opposite of what I want, of what I stand for. So I literally, before I go inside, I park my car on the side. I got out of the car, I calm myself down, and I said, shift. Where are you, Sandra? Where are you in this? Why did you let yourself go there? So I stopped. I shift. And I, I went inside. It was hurting, physically hurting. And I said, stop it, breathe, do whatever you have to do, jump, whatever, shift. You are in control, not others. But did this, did, 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 this didn't happen overnight. It takes time. Mm -hmm. So no one should blame themselves if they are not where they want to be on the process. And then that where it comes the second one. That for me it's the second tool. It's the fear going towards the acceptance. So when I'm in the position of letting everyone control in the external control, I'm in a position of fear. I'm scared of everything. 
I'm scared of what are they going to say. I'm scared of the consequences. I'm scared of the pain. I'm scared of my boss. I'm scared of my parent. I'm scared of crashing my car. I'm scared of something. So, I stop control, the fear comes. And then I freak out. We freak out. So we stop and we accept what's going on. But we only can accept when we know what the fear is. So when I know I'm scared of driving, as I said before, I have to accept the fear of driving. I have to say, I'm scared of driving. What can I do about it? Should I start just driving for 200 meters? Or should I go to do something deeper? And this goes with the job, or it goes with the illness. So first is letting go of the external control and for an internal power. We have it. We just don't acknowledge it. The second one is admitting the fear first, so then we can accept the fear and heal what we have to heal. These are my two ones, if I was clear enough. Yes, thank you, Sandra. Uh, acceptance is extremely important. But you also touched on something, both Patricia and Sandra, about the need for self-compassion. So we are on different stages of our journey. So it goes back to having compassion for ourselves along the journey as well. So we're only we're running out of time, so we only have time to take one question from the audience. Thank you for the wonderful conversation and for the authenticity and sharing from your heart. We really appreciate your stories and your journey today. So we have one question, and um, either Sandra or Patricia, you can answer this. Um, it says, you talked about control and how that helped you with your fears. How do you deal with negative thoughts Thoughts if they are triggered. I think both of you talked a little bit of, in terms of tips uh, that you would um, recommend or the things that you do to help yourself with the negative thoughts. So Patricia, do you want to just take a minute to answer that? I think the question is for Sandra because she mentioned it. Uh, okay. But if you want me to take, uh, I can, Sandra can speak first and then I take, I think. Okay. okay. Sandra, would you like to answer that? And then Patricia, if you yeah. have anything to add, sure. Thank you. Uh, a negative thought, it's, um, it's so easy to come into our mind. It's very easy. It just imagine that we are, um, we had a bad night of sleep. And um, we get up, we get out of the house and something happens. And all the crappy things come into our mind. You cannot do it. Da, 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 da. <sighs> what I do is uh, uh, clearly um, I look myself in the mirror. If I'm in my car, usually because I have to drive, I look in the back mirror. Or, you know, I just look myself in the mirror. Or just take your cell phone because we can see now ourselves in the cell phone. We just took ourselves for 30 seconds. One minute, if you can. Just acknowledge the person that is on the other side and tell that person, that's us, right? We just tell them. Just like this, if you have to, it's really like this. Hey, stop it. You are better than that. We reached this day. If you were able to get here, Stop that and go on. Breathe in, breathe out, don't freak out, put a smile and move on. Take that out of your head, because you cannot say that word here, but take the things, the negative thoughts, and move on. But I face myself, I really face myself. I look myself in my eyes and I see what I have to say to me. That's how I shift. Beautiful. 
Thank you, Sandra, for that. Um, we're going to wrap up because we literally have one minute. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Patricia, for joining us today. Thank you for our audience who joined us today. We will be back on April 20th. So we're taking a slight break because Ramadan is approaching and also uh, many people will be on spring holiday. But before we wrap up, I just want to share a quote that comes from Dr. Rachel Naomi Raymond. She is an uh, author. American author and teacher of alternative medicine. And it's just a wonderful reminder and I think a great way to end our session. She says, we are all healers. We heal with our wholeness, our humanity, all of our life experience, even our wounds. So I just wanna end our conversation there. And thank you again, Patricia and Sandra. It was so lovely to have you today. Thank you again to our first time listeners we are excited that you were able to support us today, as well as the, those of you who have joined us for previous sessions. We will see you in a few weeks. Thank you and good night. Thank you so much, Jenna and uh, uh, Sandra. It was amazing talking to you. Uh, can I just share one quote uh, before we end? Sure. Yes, so it's this still going. Is... So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the, your wound is the place your light enters which was said by Rumi and I think if you are having a wound just use it uh, as a place where you heal and you spread light by growing and contributing. Thank you so much. Uh, that is what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love Rumi and I love that quote. So thank you. And we'll put that in Rumi, the show notes somewhere. Just, and Sandra, you. you have a quote? Okay, we might as well continue. Sandra. Uh, cool. Uh, let me think. Um, my quote is uh, it's a quote about tenderness okay sure uh i read it once it belongs to someone it's not known but it's uh only the strong souls are susceptible to sustaining true tenderness and I like this one because everyone is strong enough to take their life. We are strong enough. We are susceptible. We are genuine people, all of us. So just accept yourselves, be yourselves. And healing comes and we get these opportunities to meet ladies like you and to speak. So just be tender with yourselves and with others. Thank you. That's a great way to end. Everyone share the quote. So thank you. Have a I'll share night. it. I'll and share it. Too. Yes. Yes. And Sandra, and please pick up a copy of Sandra's book. Sure. Thank yeah. you. And have a good thank night. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> it was lovely. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.